Thank you for watching this online class presentation from Cedarville University. Cedarville University offers graduate programs in business, ministry, nursing, and pharmacy, and many of them are online. We are preparing professionals to fulfill God's purpose for their life. We invite you to learn more at cedarville.edu. So, gone through uh, Christ, who He is, what He's done, salvation, thought through the gospel, union with Christ, the order of salvation. Now we're on to uh, the Holy Spirit. Great doctrine, a lot to think about, and I, uh, I won't say too much here in the beginning. I want to get you guys in on a question to begin with, but um, I think, at least in my circles, bless you, uh, in my circles, I think, a lot of times we're so uh, wanting to emphasize what the Holy Spirit doesn't do that we don't go into what he actually does do. And we tend to avoid altogether this person of the Trinity. So let me, let me just combine this. I, I have two separate parts, but let me just combine this together. So why don't you really quick start off here. Uh, go to the neighbor or two tops and just jot down three facts you know biblically about the Holy Spirit. Say, okay, I know this, I know this. Just jot down with your neighbor or two a few facts that you know. We'll, we'll get those on the board in a minute here. And then also discuss, are there a couple of questions in this doctrine you say, I would love to talk about this issue because, man, I just am curious about this or I've heard this, I'm not sure about this. So jot down a few facts that we know biblically and then also a couple of questions uh, that I'm going to try to keep in mind for going through this unit, okay? Take five minutes or so, go ahead and do that. Talk about a few things here. You guys have so some quick facts that we know. I don't ask for a reference, but it's questionable to ask for a reference. <laughs> what are some facts? Um, these are sealed for salvation. Good. <coughs> yeah, Ephesians 1. Right on. Seal of our salvation. Good. Yeah, Reese. The one who convicts us. Yeah. Right, John 14 and 16, he convicts us of sin. Others? Yeah. He dwells believers. Good. That's that whole temple of the Holy Spirit imagery in 1 Corinthians 3 and 6 and 2 Corinthians 6, which is primarily about holiness. Not exercise. Anyway, Aaron, yes. Uh, he's God. Sorry, everybody. What's that? He's God. Thank you. He's divine. He's the third person of the Trinity. He's God. Yeah. Others? He washes us and gives us regeneration. Good. Think of Titus here. He's the agent of regeneration, which means what? Two words. Well, I heard it. New life. Right on. So this word regeneration, always trying to translate churchy words, people. Regeneration means new life. Okay, good. Others? Sustains creation. Yeah, okay, so we'll get to that probably next time. His role in creation. And actually it sustains and he's creator as well as the father and son. Yeah. Any others? Counselor. Good. Jesus calls him another counselor I'll send to you. Okay, there's obviously more. Yeah, everybody. Isn't the Holy Spirit like intercede for us when we pray? We don't know what to say. Romans 8, absolutely. Intercedes for us. We don't know how to pray with groans. Tune in for words we'll discuss there as well. There's more, but the starting point there is to make sure we're thinking some of those things. Now, questions. In this doctrine, what kinds of questions come to mind? Yeah, bottom. Okay. I guess, yeah, how much do we worship and pray for, like, worship the Spirit, such pray to the Spirit specifically in comparison to Christ? It's a good question. No, it is. Because most, no, 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 because, no, no, this is good. Because most often, like, the Lord's prayer begins how? So we know we're praying to the Father. 
There are moments in Acts where they do pray directly to Jesus. We have those moments as well. Is it good to pray to the Spirit directly, to give worship to the Spirit in that way? So, at least the, the doxology thing. So, praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, right? So, no, we'll come back to that, though. It's a good question to raise. Yeah? Um, when and why within specifically the Baptist church did we start to kind of have a fear of, like, relying on the Holy Spirit or, like, talking about it? Yeah. Of, you said relying on the Spirit? Yeah, or even just like discussing it as well. It just seems like something that could shy away from the church. Yep. And we'll, I want to answer all these today. I'm going to get a picture of the phone and make sure I do answer these, but that's actually an easy one. We think about historically where that became more of an issue. Um, what is the role of the Holy Spirit like after Christ's second coming? Or like, will we still be the Holy Spirit? That's a good question. After the second coming, what is the role of the Spirit? Reese, yeah. Uh, so, like, spiritual gifts, especially, like, speaking in tongues and things, and, like, what happened? You want to know about that? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no. Probably a few of you may have that down, something like this. I only had a question about spiritual gifts of some kind. I'm curious. A few, yeah, okay. So, so yeah, the, the continuation of them, the cessation of them, which ones and why. Yeah, we'll talk about that as well for sure. Any others? Yeah, Ruth. How does the baptism from Holy Spirit? Okay. So, maybe let's see here. What is... The baptism of the Spirit. And this is this is like anything, guys. We got to think through differentiating the the indwelling of the baptism of the filling of the Spirit. Those are all different ways in which the Spirit's ministering. So we had to find what those terms mean. That's one of those that can be used in a variety of ways, and the Bible gets it a particular way. Any others? Like the discernment between yourself and the spirit in you. So like just have like questions about it and just like spirit. Yeah, I'll just put is it the spirit or just my desires? And I know you're saying there, how do you discern that to be the case? Max, see your hand as well? Yeah. How about what is the slaying of the spirit? Doesn't exist. But no, <laughs> yeah, we'll talk about it. Yeah. Slaying of the Spirit in some circles. Maybe why is that terminology used and the words that you refer to? Okay. That's right. I can read my own writing here. Yeah. I'm kind of confused. Where is that taken from in Scripture? The slaying of the Spirit? It's not. Okay. It's just a, it's a, as I'm following you, and you feel free to elaborate on this. It's an idea that you hear, it's a term you hear in certain circles that describes a phenomena of the Spirit's work allegedly working in a person's life, typically by them falling down to the ground and convulsing. And I'm not, when I say these things, I'm not trying to be, I'm not poking fun. I'm not at all trying to poke fun. I'm just saying in the context, I've heard this phrase being used. Typically, it is some kind of person saying, you know, have the Spirit, may he be upon you, and people fall over and have these experience, these ecstatic experiences. So usually, that's from a more uh, fringe, charismatic kind of approach to this. Is that what you're, you're thinking of there? Okay. So we'll talk more about that as well. Because there, there are different renditions. When you say charismatic or Pentecostal, you can't say that's just one lump thing. You got to think through the breadth of that. Any others? It's a good, good question here. We'll stop there. So, here's where we're going. I do want to discuss this as we go through. Well, some of these will be, we'll just go right through and it'll be in the content. Some, though, I want to make sure we, we go through and stop as well to talk about. So, I want to think through this section, who is the Spirit? And a little bit today on that, we'll just get in the biblical side of, of that aspect of the Spirit as well. Work in ministries of the Spirit. How does the Spirit work today? Because the Spirit is at work today. He is. So, in what way is He at work? And how does he gift the church today? There's 
a quote here I'll read to you, and this is book's a few years old now. It's called The Forgotten God by Francis Chan. Speaking of the Holy Spirit, he says this, You might think that calling the Holy Spirit the forgotten God is a bit extreme. From my perspective, the Holy Spirit is tragically neglected and for all practical purposes forgotten. While no evangelical would deny its existence, I'm willing to bet there are millions of churchgoers across America who cannot confidently say they've experienced his presence or action in their lives over the past year, and many of them do not believe they can. That's my introduction in this book here. And, and I want to just go with that and say that for, from my context in this kind of small, very conservative Baptist church in New York, there are a lot of moments in the pulpit uh, where my pastor would say something to the effect of, hey, the Spirit does not do these things. And I didn't catch it as a kid too much. But now in hindsight, I can look and say, oh, they're trying to make sure we're, we're differentiating ourselves from the Pentecostal church down the street. Just be really clear. They're trying to say, we, the Spirit does not do this, doesn't gift in this way, doesn't do these things or that thing. And I can't recall a time, although I wasn't the greatest listener, growing up in church, but I cannot recall a time thinking through all the times the Spirit was mentioned, which wasn't very often, where it was mentioned, sorry, where he was mentioned in a, in a positive, here's all that he does in your life kind of a way. I'm sure it was. I just don't recall it being the, the, the dominant theme as we talked about this, which is, I think, unfortunate. So in terms of our doctrinal statement here at Cedarville, Going to read this, and we'll, we'll come back to some of these points here as we go through. We believe the Spirit is a divine person, equal in nature with God, the Father, and God the Son. And we'll discuss that here in just a minute. The Spirit had an active role in creation and inspiration of the Scriptures. He convicts sinners, guides humans into truth, and regenerates believers to new life, baptizes them in Christ, and serves as their assurance to eternal life. That's Romans 8, where it says like he's the the witness that we've been adopted by God. Beautiful stuff. Believers mature in their faith through the work of the Spirit. It's that fruit of the Spirit idea. Who produces his, his fruit in them? The gifts of the Spirit. Now, all that so far, you're kind of like, yes, 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 yes. Then maybe, I don't know where you guys are with this, but the gifts of the Spirit are for ministry to the body of Christ and the, God in quotes, the sign gifts are not intended to be a pattern for today. Now, really briefly, we'll go back to this after next week. Sign gifts refer to those gifts um, that would be things like tongues, prophecies, uh, gifts of healing, uh, th things that were demonstrative signs we see in Acts that were done that demonstrate the apostles' teaching and all those things. So we're saying here, uh, those sign gifts are not intended to be a pattern for today. So I want to talk more about that because there's, there's nuance there uh, to the way that that's said and trying to think through three kind of views later on to think through gifts have ceased or cessationism or all gifts are continuing, call it continuationism or some middle ground of saying we affirm God can work how he wants to work because he's God and he's sovereign but it's, we read text and read that to say these gifts that were more prevalent here aren't regular normative things today. So there's three kinds of views on that, that whole idea which we'll come back to. Does that make sense, though, for sign gifts, what I what mean by that? Okay. We'll get back there for sure. So it is the Spirit that makes God real in the experience and life of believers. But as a doctrine, I think for, for many of us, perhaps in your backgrounds, if you're from uh, Baptist or Bible or non-denominational churches, maybe you, maybe you got a really massive, good teaching dose of the Holy Spirit. Praise God. Maybe you didn't. I don't know. But it seems at times that's not always the, the biggest thing. Because, I mean, we're going here a lot. He's the culmination of the storyline. He's the, the way in which we're saved and what salvation is. But we said it before, the Spirit works this, applies this, to us in various ways. Uh, it could be, I always recall this, I was raised in a church that early on uh, used the King James Bible. I don't know if any of you guys did when you were growing up at all, but like what my, until I was like 10, I used the King James Bible. And I recall reading like the Holy Ghost. And, and my, my understanding of ghosts uh, made that, that world weird. 
because I, I was thinking of like oh, Holy Ghost, uh, like Jacob Marley. Uh, okay, so I, I just like equate those two, and like, that's not exactly what's going on there. So like the best way to translate that term, even in terms of the Spirit. So I think sometimes modern ideas of the Spirit and who He is and what He does can get equated to the force. <laughs> you know what I mean? It can get more like, it's like this, oh, it's this, oh, you know, kind of, kind of thing that we do, and there's power. In fact, in, and he didn't watch this at this point, but in Acts 8, there's a guy named Simon who watches the apostles do work through the Spirit, and he's like, I will pay you money for that stuff, man. Give me that power. And Peter's like, paraphrase, uh, you're an idiot. Like that, that's not how this goes. You're missing the whole point. You don't purchase with money. This comes through Jesus and grace. So I think sometimes we think of the Spirit as kind of like, yes, like the force surrounds us, binds us, blah, blah, blah. Like, so yeah, how, that's not how this works. And one of, the, one of the best indications of this, I think, sometimes is we tend to, I did it in class already today. We tend to at times refer to the Spirit as it. And I'm going to show you, the Spirit is He. It's a person. So we want to refer to that in that way as well. All that to say, one of the points here in introduction, despite the elusiveness and the complications, we need to attend to this uh, for a lot of reasons. And, and one big one that I would say currently, especially, is that I mean, this, the 20th century, from 1901 with Agnes Osmond and others, I'll describe that later on as well in this unit, onwards, this has been the century of the Holy Spirit. Because if you know anything of the history of the Pentecostal movement and charismatic churches and all this transpired and how globally they are continuing to grow and expand, uh, they talk a lot about the Spirit, a lot. And so you can't ignore that and say, I just, de I just deny its existence. It, those churches are growing everywhere. So they speak of the Spirit. How do you speak of the Spirit? Why? In what ways biblically do we want to see things? And how should they be said? So just trying to think through those matters there. we got to at least look at that and say, okay, is that accurate? Is it not accurate? What would I say about the Spirit? What would I affirm or deny the Spirit is doing and who He is? And also we got to just say, He's at work in your life. He's operative in your life. He's God, the Spirit at work in you in a lot of ways. He's, he's indwelling you, right? Said in sanctification, like he's the means of our growth going forward. So that's a few reasons why I want to think through this doctrine. It's really, really key for us to, to keep in mind. So again, backgrounds, whatever it is for you, church life coming back. I just want to try to think about the Bible and what's being said and think on it with you and uh, go through it together. So, start with this. Let's start with the nature of God's Spirit. Hit a few of these things before we, before we go today. So, when we speak of God's Spirit, we are not just speaking of an impersonal force. It's key to keep in mind. Nor is it just some kind of extension of God. He is God operating. It's a personal, divine being. So, if you have Bibles, let's get them out. If you don't have them out yet, let's get Bibles out the Spirit's deity, that the Spirit's godness can be seen in three ways. So we'll look at these together just for some, some passages here. So first, there are ascriptions of deity. Like, I ascribe to the Holy Spirit, he is divine. So, a few of these. Let's go to Acts 5. Let's turn to that one, Acts 5. Got a few there, let's go to, go to one. But as well, I'll just say Matthew 28 is one up there as well. Um, when we, I saw a few baptisms at my church on Sunday, which was really encouraging to see. And when we baptize, you know, there's always a little bit different, however pastors do this or whoever's doing the baptism. You know, are you trusting in Christ for salvation? Do you want to uh, say this by baptism today? Yes, yes. All right. Then I recall... My daughter has been baptized. I was an elder at my church at that point, so I had a chance to baptize my daughter, which was really cool. That was a really neat, neat thing to do. So I said, and she loved this. She thought it was really funny. I said, okay, based on your confession of faith, I baptize you, my sister, 
which she thought was like the goofiest thing. And I was just like, no, 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 like, you're my daughter, but you're my sister in Christ. And she's like, okay. So I said, but I baptize you, my sister, in the name of, so Matthew 28, Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yeah, 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 right on. So it'd be weird to baptize in this triune name of God if the Spirit's not God. Romans 5. This is a crazy story. This is Ananias and Sapphira. Remember this? So um, all these people are giving their proceeds to others and saying, hey, you, I want to be generous. You have my, my excess. And they're sharing generously. Verse 1, a man named Ananias and his wife Sapphira had sold a piece of property and with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. So it's, it sounds like from the text here, he sold it for 10 grand, we'll just say, and he, he brought like three grand, which is really, really generous. But he sounds like is saying, that's all the proceeds I got from selling this is $3,000, but he's keeping back seven grand for himself. So verse three, Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? After it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you continue to try this deed in your heart? You've not lied to man, but to, what does it say? God. So just note in verse 4, he's lying to God. In verse 3, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to who? Holy Spirit. So Peter seems to be equating here the Spirit with God, and, and you know how the story goes, right? Don't, don't lie to apostles. Anyway, so, uh, but no, like, recognize here there's a, there's a real seriousness to uh, this call in the church. But the point we're trying to make here is to say when Peter talks about the Spirit, he talks of him in a way that is, he's divine. When you're lying to the Spirit, you're lying to God, and that's big problems. So there's descriptions. Secondly, there's actions of deity. Actions of deity. So, got here, uh, conviction of sin. I mean, d- does anyone recall these verses, Titus 3, 4 through 7, that you memorized so gloriously? I'll put you on the spot. But you, if you recall those verses, <coughs> keep them, y'all. Keep them in your heart. Uh, you recall in verse 5 that there's this regenerating work of the Spirit, that new birth is given through the Spirit. And again, new birth for us is not given through anyone but God alone. Right, sanctifying as well in First Corinthians. So there's there's certain actions that he does. He'd say, "That's only God. That's only God. God does that." And then also here, there are attributes. Just one example. There's there's others, like you say he's creator in Genesis one verse two. You see that idea there. Uh, Hebrews nine, as well. I'll start verse thirteen. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself through, without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Again, just, I just did the theology one this I mean, a couple days ago. Eternality equals God. <laughs> There's no other being in the universe that says, I am eternal. So the eternal spirit there in Hebrews 9 is one of, of many that would think of those things. So ascriptions, actions, attributes of deity would say the spirit is divine. Good? Okay. Let me then just go through. That, that's, that's deity. Let's now go through personhood and just uh, get this. Three volunteers here. Romans 8, 27, someone grab that. Romans 8, 27, thanks to that, just to read that. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 11, thank you. And then Olivia can get Ephesians 4, verse 30. So the last slide was deity. This slide is, okay, is the spirit a person or some kind of force? We're going to say he's a person. I'm going to define personhood in this way. Personhood uh, is defined as one who has intellect, emotions or affections, and then volition or a will. That, that denotes personhood. So does the Spirit have those kinds of qualities? Romans 8, 27. Zach, go ahead. If you search his heart, you know the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit for the saints according to the will of God. Okay, so 
He who searches hearts knows, I'm sorry, yeah, knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. So he's got a mind. He knows, he knows our hearts. It says he, he intercedes with groanings too deep for words for us. He knows us, our needs, and he knows God's will as well as knowledge the Spirit has of these things. Okay? Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 11. Okay, this is referring to spiritual gifts and trying to work through, okay, the will of the Spirit and what He does and how He does that. He apportions to each one as He wills. So the Spirit, with every believer, man, I remember being a pastor in Wisconsin. I've been told this more than once. I had a lady in my church who was, was just convinced she said, you know, everybody has spiritual gifts. Because I was talking about spiritual gifts in, in a Sunday morning service, and she came afterwards. She's like, I know everyone's gifted, but I don't think the Spirit's gifted me. I just don't know what that could possibly be. It just feels so normal and mundane and blah, blah, blah. So I said to her, like, no, you're not, you're not that special. I'm sorry. Like, you are gifted. That's just the way it is. I'm sorry. You are gifted. She's like, I yeah, yes, you are. I've got a verse right here. The Spirit apportions to each one, each one. As he wills. Verse 7, to each is given a manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. You're part of the each, so you have gifts. Congratulations. But here, the Spirit wills that. Right? He, he wills to everyone in this room that knows Christ. He has, this is beyond the point, but he's gifted you. And your purpose with that gift is to serve others in the body of Christ with that gift. You may say, like, man, I'm, I'm just like, like in this chapter, I'm like a toe. My gift is it's like behind the scenes. And like, yeah, if I don't have a big toe, that's a problem. Every part of the body matters. So the Spirit willfully gifts us for functions in the body. Anyway, Ephesians 4.30. One last one here. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, that you be sealed for the day of redemption. Okay, so there, there is a possibility of grieving the Spirit. We read all over the Old Testament, God grieving over certain things. He says, don't grieve the Spirit by, by your sin, by doing these things. So there, there's an emotional aspect to the Spirit. Just saying all those things to say, He, not it. All right, so we see a lot of references to the Spirit with a masculine pronoun in various places in the New Testament, especially. So we want to we, we catch ourselves at times doing this. So be, just be careful as you think through. It's not, it's not Luke Skywalker. It's not the force. This is a person who's doing a work. So, just say this. Uh, it's important to know the progressive aspect of the revelation of the Spirit. How it works in all of history from old to new. Let me ask you guys really quick this question. Have you ever noticed any differences in the way the Spirit operates in the Old Testament versus the New Testament? Do you any differences there are in his ministry, like the Old Testament versus the New Testament, ways that he functions that differ between those time periods? Any thoughts here? Max, yeah. In the New Testament, he fills all people who have faith in God. Okay, so yeah, brilliant. So in the New Testament, we see he indwells all people who have faith in God, which is... One of the promises of the new covenant. This is Ezekiel 36, I'll put my spirit within you. Remember that? Or uh, in Acts 2, when everyone thinks that they're drunk as they're speaking in tongues, Peter says, no, 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 no. This is Joel 2. I'll put my spirit within you. Young, old, male, female, rich, poor, slave, free. Yeah, so indwelling. And in the Old Testament, who does he indwell? Not everyone, but who does he indwell? What are some examples? David's one, good. I'm thinking Old Testament here, but that's, that's okay. But it's still like prior to some things in the New Testament for sure, obviously. So uh, David, even the king before him, Saul, remember that? Now Saul, it says, is filled with the Spirit. What happens eventually in Saul's life? The Spirit's taken from him and replaced with an with a evil, unclean spirit, it says. We're reading this in our family devotions. Our kids are like, ah, so we're... Theology time at the Kimball House, all the time. Um, so going through all that, so that there's a way. This is maybe why in Psalm 51, 
David prays, take not your Holy Spirit from me. Though I would say, I don't think that's a New Testament prayer. It's a, it's a, a shift in New Covenant realities of the Spirit's indwelling presence. But in the Old Testament, you see this a possibility of him leaving. Uh, kings receive the Spirit. Uh, we see prophets receive the Spirit. Uh, we see judges. What kind of judges receive the Spirit? Have anybody? Samson. When the Spirit comes on him, what does he do? He goes beast mode, right? <laughs> it's like, yeah, he kills, he kills a lot of people. He pushes down pillars and buildings topple over, right? He tears a lion in two. Uh, yeah. I, I love it. It's a random thing. Like, he, he tore a lion in two as one tears a young goat. Which I'm like, I haven't torn a young goat, but okay. Uh, that's there in the text in Samuel. So there are different, think of this, judges, prophets, and kings. Uh, you have Oholiab and Bezalel. Remember who they are? Those two names? These are the, the builders of the tabernacle. Kind of the, the uh, one two years ago said, the first engineers. And I was like, y yes. Uh, even you can say the first artist that's very aesthetically pleasing as well. So engineers with aesthetic taste, um, which is always true, right? So, yeah, <laughs> anyway. So all, all I to say, it's certain offices in the Old Testament that receive. It's not necessarily permanent. And then the New Testament, it is for all believers. And to Autumn's point about the disciples, in John, and we'll, we'll just stop here with this. It's, it's a really neat thing to see. In John 16, he says, uh, the Spirit is with you and will be in you. 